I'm very pleased to be joined by Queens City Council member Eric Joya. He's a candidate for New York City Public Advocate. Welcome to Citywide. Thanks for having me on, Ken. As a result of the council's actions on term limit, you could run for a sure re-election mm -hmm. to your council seat in Long Island City and the neighborhoods around it in Queens. Instead, you are in a multi-candidate race for an office that most people don't even know exists. <laughs> Why? Well, when you put it that way, it sounds like such an appealing concept. I don't know how I could say no to it. Uh, the truth is, is that I think the only question you really have to ask yourself is, can you make a difference? The only reason I ran for office for the first time in 2001 is because I thought I could make a difference. I thought I could improve my neighborhood. And that's the same exact reason I'm running for public advocate. There's a lot of people in this town, especially in these tough economic times, who really need somebody on their side, um, who need somebody who sees the life they're going through. Um, and uh, I think I could, I could do a, a whole lot of good as public advocate. So what does that job even mean? Well, I think, I think it's... The public advocate is attorney general for New York City. You're the person who goes out there and fights for people who have nobody else to turn to. You know, for, for a lot of, uh, a long time, uh, people who are well off, when they're in trouble, they go out and they hire a lobbyist or they hire a lawyer. And all the rest of us are told, why don't you write a letter instead? Uh, and when I travel around the city, both in my neighborhood, in, in Woodside and Sunnyside, Mass, Beth, Astoria, Long Island City and Queens, but then as I travel everywhere else, uh, all the other boroughs, people tell me this all the time, whether it be the, the school their kids are going to, whether it be what they're facing at work. Some people have deplorable landlords or, or bosses who are doing things to their workers you can't believe are happening in New York City in the 21st century, and they don't know where to turn. The luxury of being public advocate is that you don't have to wake up and run the city. You're not the mayor of New York. It's not the most powerful position in the city, uh, in city government. But you are David's slingshot against Goliath. It's your job to go out there to find people who need standing up for and do, it, and do just that. Some people have suggested that the office has been somewhat deflated by the incumbent Betsy Gottbaum's approach to it. When Mark Green was the public advocate, he was famous for battling Rudy Giuliani, putting out important reports and position papers, um, and basically trying to influence city policy on a, on a pretty substantive level. Do you think that the that 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 there's a that the Gottbaum model for the office is the is the right model and and what would you do differently? Well, let me just say first, I don't think that's fair to Betsy Gottbaum at all. Um, the only true measure of an elected official of a public servant is are people's lives better because of the work they've done or not. You cannot measure success in, in newspaper clips or press conferences. There's this old style of politics or what people think are politics. I, I call it crossfire politics, where um, for a long time in this country, people thought you put two opposing sides on television. They yell at each other for 20 to 30 minutes. It's like the World Wrestling Federation. Um, you see who's the, the wittiest or the smartest. And then the show ends and they, they go their separate ways. And somehow, that was supposed to improve somebody's life. Um, I don't think that's right. But but Betsy herself has dis defined her office as almost a, a super council member's office, a constituent service office where it's 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 solving problems one at a time, as opposed to, with a few exceptions to that, taking on the mayor and saying, I think this is moving in the wrong direction, or putting some idea out there and trying to force the city council to adopt a new policy. Uh, well, is it I mean, a citywide job or is it a, an individual job? Well, it, it's partly both, and I think someone to do it effectively has to be able to do both. L let me step away from the, the Betsy model uh, approach, because I think it's unfair to her to, to really look at it that, and I'm sure she can come on and tell you about some of the things she's doing, although I will say that the work we, she and I have done together, working on hunger and food stamps, particularly child hunger, um, uh, I'm very proud of, and I know she is as well, and it's very impressive, and has made a difference both on the individual level and uh, on the macro citywide level. But, but part of my approach, and I'll tell you the way I look at my district, um, I think it was Brandeis who said that states are little laboratories for democracy. Well, I've looked at my district as this little laboratory, a place where we try out new ideas and say, what really works here? Um, and much of what I do is look at my own life and say, how has this worked? How has a kid from Woodside, Queens, who worked his way through school, working nights as a janitor, ended up working in the White House, becoming a lawyer, and running for office? How does that happen? Uh, because I, I know that I'm lucky. I know that I'm living the American dream. The job of this city is to make sure that every single kid, whether how much money they have in the bank, it, does, it should not matter whatever language they speak at home, it should not matter. They should have the same fair shot that I've had. And so I've begun uh, to create these little micro-initiatives in my neighborhood that my hope is that once you prove that they work, 
they begin to get replicated neighborhood Give by neighborhood. Give us an example. Well, I give out a hardback dictionary to every single graduating elementary school student in my district. The reason I do is that when I was a little boy, I was given the advice that I should read the newspaper every single day, circle the words I don't know, and go home and look them up. Now, this is a pretty low-tech solution, but what I started to do was every graduating fifth and sixth grade in my district gets a hardback dictionary, a collegiate dictionary, with a letter from me with that exact advice. Read the newspaper, circle the words you don't know, and go home and look them up. When I walk down the street now, I have 18 and 19 year olds coming up to me telling me, Councilman, I brought that dictionary to college with me. Now, on a few different levels, this works. One, it, it creates this lifelong love of reading, but it's also about showing somebody that you can be self-sufficient, that you can be independent, that uh, a kid with a library card and a dictionary can open up a whole world of learning. And it's an, the other thing I like about it is it says somebody out there noticed your achievement. You just graduated elementary school. You should be proud. And then it sets that course right to college. And I think, especially in where I grew up, that's something that wasn't talked about enough, that, that this is something that is attainable for every one of us, a college education. Tell us a little bit about your district. I represent one of the most diverse districts in the entire city, not just ethnically, but also socioeconomically, from the Queens waterfront, uh, Queensbridge Houses, Ravenswood, to uh, Woodside, Sunnyside, Maspeth, and Astoria. You have what used to be known as the Archie Bunker District. Now, I don't know if Archie ever really lived there, but that's what it used to be called, a district that, uh, that would vote would registered Democrat, but that would vote Republican, voted for Ronald Reagan and, and others. Um, and then I came along, as progressive as I am, as young as I am, and people said, you have no chance of getting elected in this district, and especially with your positions. And I'd go around and I'd talk about food stamps or child hunger. And I remember someone said to me once, that's not going to be popular in this district. And I said, are you kidding? Of course it is. Nobody wants to see hungry children uh, in this neighborhood or in this city. The reason you don't think it's popular is that for too long, politicians have walked into neighborhoods like this and, and thrown red meat at the crowd and tried to divide folks up. I believe that you can appeal to people as better angels. Give them, uh, give them a reason to believe again in government, not try to get them to turn off or tune out to government. Maybe I'm showing my age, but one of the impacts of term limits is that um, elective office seems to be populated these days with young, ambitious, technically proficient in the business um, career politicians. Uh, some of the competitors that you have for the public advocate race, um, uh, good legislators, uh, but they fit that mode. It's, 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 that's the business they've been in, and they've been at it since they were in their, in their, uh, in their mm -hmm. 20s. Isn't there something to be said for some life experience and for career experience outside of government and politics? I think there's a lot to be said for that. And I think that, um, well, I think that the equation that's wrong is you have a lot of people who do public service to get ahead in politics. I don't like that. And I, I, I frankly, I'm not that big a fan of politics. I think people should do politics to get ahead in public service. Um, there is a dramatic desperate need for public servants in this city. Um, and, uh, and I think politics is what you have to do to get that public service done. Um, I think all too often people confuse that equation. Uh, and, and, you know, those of us who, who do it day to day know who's doing what for what. What's your critique of Mayor Bloomberg? Good mayor, bad mayor, deserves re-election? I think, he's, I think he's a good mayor, and I think he's actually improved. I think he started off as a good mayor and got even better. Um, and I think, especially uh, in these tough times, I was just talking to him the other day. He and I walked uh, along a pretty long parade route the other day. I know he, he's very focused on trying to make sure that New York City, uh, that this economy, uh, that people who are struggling um, have some opportunity in this economy. But I just want to finish up on that on another question. I think that. Not only is life experience important in government, but I know when I talk to people in my neighborhood, they tell me all the time that they're concerned that people at City Hall don't see what they see. They're not living the same life that they're living. And there's a real concern, I have a real concern, about this city right now, that you have some who are just fabulously wealthy. Uh, they're, they're flying in private jets. Uh, I mean, it's almost their feet don't touch the same ground that, that my feet touch and your feet touch. And then you have everybody else uh, who are, are struggling. They're worried about their kids going to school. They're trying to pay the rent or their mortgage payments. Uh, and, and they don't know if they're going to have a job. Or, or even if they do work their job their entire life, that there won't be any savings there or pension there for them when they retire. And so I think there's a real hunger out there 
for people who understand what it's like to be a real New Yorker. Now, as you know, I mean, my family's been in Queens. We, we run a little flower shop. It's been there for 108 years. They came to Queens when it was a little more than farmland. I worked my way through school, working nights as a janitor. Um, when you do that, you have a, a certain appreciation. I know I, when I'd go back to school and see the kids whose folks were paying their way, they were good kids, they're a lot of my friends, but they didn't appreciate what they were getting as much as I did. And even now, I mean, I work a lot of hours, and people say, well, you work so many hours, you must be tired. And I say, well, I'm not pushing a broom at 3 o'clock in the morning uh, to pay for school. That was hard work. This, I put in a lot of hours, but it doesn't even scratch the surface or compare to how hard I was working. And, and I, think, I think that's what you're getting at, and I think that's what's important, is to bring the perspective of a real New Yorker uh, to City Hall. It's one thing to read about poverty in a in a textbook or in a briefing paper. It's another thing to know what it's like to truly struggle. We're going to continue our conversation with Eric Joya when Citywide uh, comes back right after this. Happening. This can't be happening. Of course it's not happening. Armored car. <laughs> Listen, having money isn't about luck. Make your own coffee. Save a thousand bucks a year. Feed me. Feed the pig. Welcome back to Citywide. We're talking politics with City Council Member Eric Joya, candidate for public advocate. So before the break, you were talking about um, the need for real New Yorkers to, to speak up for uh, people who don't have, I think uh, you said, the, the private jets and whose feet don't turn the ground, that uh, touch the ground. That was right after you, you told me that you thought that Mike Bloomberg was doing a good job. So <laughs> Mike Bloomberg is one of those super rich people whose feet don't touch the ground and flies around in a private jet. Um, do you think that he <laughs> Wait, <laughs> relates <laughs> to the average New Yorker? <laughs> to be clear, you have drawn together two separate answers, <laughs> it, you, trying as hard as you, you can to get me in serious trouble on television. Tonight. So let's see you get out of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wasn't talking about him. I, I really wasn't. Um, I mean, listen, I mean, obviously, uh, Mayor Bloomberg is a very wealthy man, uh, and I congratulate him for that. Uh, but to defend him for a second, he actually, he made his money himself. Uh, and so while I don't know that he was ever poor in his life, uh, he, he was not born with a silver spoon in his mouth. Um, and I think he's done a good job of getting around and, and actually uh, speaking to, to New Yorkers. But... I obviously come from a very different place. Um, you know, growing up, and it's a funny thing growing up in New York City. I remember I went down to Georgetown for law school, and my dad drove down to visit me, and he was driving a car that was probably 15 or probably almost 20 years old. And a friend of mine from law school looked at me and said, oh, your dad collects antique cars. And I said, yeah, that's right. We've got 10 more of those at home, you know, because he looked at me uh, and thought, well, there's no way that, that I could possibly be poor uh, because I was well-educated. I'm white. Uh, and so there's a real misconception about what it means uh, to, to be low income, to be poor in New York City. We live in a great city. We're an aspirational city. So people come here willing and wanting to work hard for a better life for themselves and more importantly for their kids. Um, but when I was growing up, we didn't have anything. Uh, I mean, we didn't have health insurance most years. We didn't make a lot of money. We could barely make the rent. We didn't have a car. But I grew up in a city that gave me a good enough education um, that I was uh, able to, um, well, to do some pretty big things. But not only was it the public school, there was a library across the street. Um, and not only was there a library across the street, but it was time for me to earn a living. There was a job there for me to do that and, and a pretty good wage. It was a tough job. But you put all that together. And that's New York. It's a city of opportunity. There, um, one of the, the issues, the signature issues, you alluded to it before, um, has been hunger in New York. Mm -hmm. And your efforts um, uh, by going on a very restricted diet, I want you to tell us about that, uh, to publicize um, uh, this is an issue in New York City. But how much poverty is there in New York? After, obviously, we're going through it some tough times now. But over the last decade, we went through unprecedented prosperity mm -hmm. in, in New York. Um, were people left behind? Oh, there's no doubt. I mean, we are coming out of another gilded age where the, the wealthy became fabulously wealthy, where the middle class uh, struggled and struggled and struggled. Many were forced to move out of New York City, and the poor, um, well, they really got hammered. And 
I mean, the numbers are pretty stark when you look at it. About 2 million New Yorkers qualify for food stamps. A little over a million, say 1.1 million people get it. That means about 900,000 New Yorkers qualify for federal food aid and don't get it. Hundreds of thousands of kids in New York City. And the reason I think there's such a disconnect is because you don't see it. It's not like that old Sally Struthers commercial where, where kids are, are walking around the streets of Manhattan, you know, with uh, distended bellies or, or passing out. The face of poverty in New York City is an obese child. Because, now, so you, you mentioned it. I lived on food stamps last year for one week to show how difficult it is to get by on the allotment. $28.36 for seven days. I ran out of food in five days. I had to go to a, a food pantry to get dinner. Now, I, I, I told you I didn't grow up with a lot of money, but I was never hungry. Um, I mean, we didn't eat fancy food, but we ate in my house. Um, for the first time in my life, I had hunger pains in that week when I lived on food stamps. And the cruel irony is that I gained two pounds after seven days because the only food I could afford was junk food. It was high in salt. It was high in calories. It was high in fat. It was the very worst food that you could buy. Um, and, uh, and I'm happy to say that after I went down to Washington, D.C., we, we, uh, to speak with uh, Congressman Rangel and other members of Congress, we've made some real changes. And I'd like to think part of it was raising awareness about how unfair uh, the food stamp process was. When I started this and working with Betsy Gottbaum, the food stamp application in this town it was 24 pages long. I mean, that's hard to believe. Well, what information do you need to know? I mean, how much money do folks make? Do they have kids and do they have assets? That's really all you need to know. The city's done a very good job of cutting that red tape. The application is now down to two pages of questions, about two pages of explanations on how to answer the, the first two pages of questions. So we've taken some positive steps in the right direction. But to give you an idea of, of the poverty in New York, when you realize that, that one in six New Yorkers qualifies for federal food aid. I mean, that's significant. Um, the city itself, through the Department of Education, is uh, the breakfast program for poor kids is one of the biggest providers of, of food itself in the city. That's exactly right. New York City is doing a good job at giving free breakfast uh, to any New York City uh, school uh, ch uh, child. I'm moving forward on a, I'm trying to expand that. What I'd like to see happen is breakfast in the classroom. Um, you let the kids eat actually in the classroom. Newark, New Jersey did this. We have very low utilization rates for, for school breakfast. Um, by putting it in the classroom, you get up to almost 100% of the kids eating. We're not talking about Eggs Benedict here. It's kids eating a bowl of cereal or a muffin mm -hmm. or a banana. And, and what's important about this is that it's not, it's nutrition alone is important, but kids who eat right grow better, learn better, are healthier long term. We're talking about the next generation of, of New Yorkers. Um, and uh, a matter of fact, a school teacher is the one who got me to begin to work on a food stamp issue. She told me she watches kids who she knows didn't have breakfast, suspects some of them didn't have dinner, come into the classroom in the morning, they stare up in the space all morning, they go have lunch, they carbo load, they come back in, their head's on the table all afternoon. So she's lost a child because that child's not eating uh, the way that child should. And unlike some issues in government, you know, as you know, we face some things we don't know the answer to. This isn't one of them. We can end hunger in New York City, especially child hunger. If we do this right, we can bring billions of dollars in federal aid to New York City. Uh, and we can be the leader for the entire country at showing how you can implement a federal program appropriately, um, chip away at poverty, and create that pathway to the middle class by helping kids out. We're now in a very different era. The economic meltdown mm -hmm. is devastating uh, to the city in so many different ways. I think like other recessions, uh, it's come to New York a year later after it's hit uh, other parts of the country. But in past recessions, it's taken New York much longer mm -hmm. to, to climb out of it. Here, it's folks in, uh, in neighborhoods like uh, the Rockaways or, or East New York or at risk of losing their, their homes. Uh, that they may have financed with a subprime mortgage. Um, it's Wall Street, the engine of New York uh, being devastated, uh, the Wall Street bonuses providing a big part of the city uh, tax base. Um, and at the same time, we have challenges in our infrastructure, the schools, and unfinished business from the last decade. Which holes in the dike do you put your finger into first? And what needs to be done to rally New Yorkers to work together rather than being at each other's throats? Well, I mean, I, th I, think, I think we have a great opportunity here in New York. Um, we are a city where people want to live. And for a city to be successful as we move forward, uh, any city this is, but especially New York, and this is why we're so well positioned for the 21st century, is you want to be 
a place where people around the world say, I want to spend at least one day in my life there. And the truth is, if you get them young enough, they'll spend uh, decades of their life here. Um, we need, as a city, to move away from a pure focus on finance, insurance, and real estate. John Sexton at NYU calls it the fire economy, uh, finance, insurance, real estate, and move towards a combination of fire and what he calls ice, um, intellectual, cultural, educational. Uh, and when you put that together, in other words, universities, museums, um, smart companies like Google and Microsoft, places where companies go because they want employees. And if you're a city that attracts uh, young families, and how do you do that? Well, you have a city that has great schools, a city that has safe neighborhoods, and housing that people can afford to live in in neighborhoods that they're proud of. So if you can do those three things, uh, you can be a sustainable city uh, moving uh, deep into the 21st century. Now, the, the current economy, obviously, you know, the Dow is, uh, it seems, is crashing every day now. Um, some of that's out of our control. But what you have to do is focus on those fundamentals. And if you do, um, New York City is going to do just fine. So the position of a public advocate, not as well known, obviously, as the mayor or, or perhaps some other positions, uh, council, uh, council speaker, has attracted a field, at least for the Democratic primary, um, that includes uh, two, possibly three other members of the city council and two uh, more uh, uh, veterans, I would say, of the political scene, uh, not uh, necessarily elected officials, but, but well, currently, but people who have been been out there on the uh, on the policy uh, picket lines for many years. Talk a little bit about the approach to the race that you have, how you differentiate yourself, and how you can become known uh, to such a large city from such a small base like a council district. Well, uh, a few things. I mean, I think and I know. Um, that people in New York really want something different. Uh, th people in New York want new vision, new vigor, new ideas. They know that we can do better in government. New Yorkers are the most demanding people in the entire world. We expect the most from our sports teams, from our families, from our employers. But somehow in government, we say, you know, just don't go to jail and don't raise my taxes too much and that'll be okay. Uh, and you, you can't blame folks. Someone said to me, that the difference between skepticism uh, and cynicism is that cynics lack hope. Skeptics have hope, but it's been tempered by experience. So I think New Yorkers, when they think about politics, are those skeptics. What we have to do is get people to believe again, to believe anew, that working together, we can accomplish great things, that New York by itself can be a leader for the entire globe. When we get something right, the world uh, watches and, and copies that. My job over the next six months is to go out um, and to run the exact grassroots campaign that I've been running. I'm a big believer in going to where people are, block by block, stoop to stoop, living room to living room. At this point, we've raised well over $3 million. The most common contribution is 10 bucks. Um, it's, uh, which I have to say, a kid from Woodside, without any political connections or famous relatives or you know rich relatives, whatever it may be, I'm, I'm amazed sometimes that we've been able to do this. Uh, and it's part shoe leather and that we've been working very hard at it, and part um, new technology, whether it be the internet or Facebook or emails or Twitter. Um, we've attracted thousands and thousands of people around the city um, who want to get involved and who know we can do better. Um, when I first ran, uh, I... Uh, I experienced this, where what you see is, I, I call it mayors of the block, people who coach the Little League or volunteer at their church or their synagogue, but don't get involved in campaigns, uh, in politics. They'll vote, but they'll say, why in the world would I volunteer? It doesn't make any sense. Whatever I do, the outcome will be the same. And when I first ran in 2001, I, I was able to successfully convince folks that their efforts mattered, that not only could we win an election, but we could change a neighborhood. And that's exactly what we've done. And now... Um, I have to say, I think we're well on our way to proving to people around this city that if they get involved, we can win this race. They will have somebody at City Hall who they know is on their side every single day. Um, and once again, I think that they'll be proud of their government. My thanks to Queen City Council member Eric Joya. It's somebody to watch out for. He's a candidate for New York City public advocate. I'm Ken Fisher. Thanks for joining us on this edition of Citywide.